The speakers for this session are, first of all, Dr. Neil Shanks, who has um, remarkable qualifications, both as a teacher in the sciences and as a person trained in philosophy. Actually, both of our speakers are remarkable in terms of their qualifications. Uh, Dr. Shanks is, uh, teaches at East Tennessee State University. He uh, has written a book called God, the Devil, and Darwin, and at least uh, from my point of view, very interested to see that he has uh, his training in philosophy as well. Um, Bill Dembski, William Dembski, is Associate Research Professor in the Conceptual Foundations of Science at Baylor University and a Senior Fellow with the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture in Seattle. He's taught at Northwestern, University of Notre Dame, the University of Dallas. He is um, highly trained both in, mathemat in mathematics and again in philosophy. We're going to follow the same format that we had before. Uh, each speaker will have 25 minutes and they will be addressing the question, could intelligent design in biological systems be scientifically detectable and has it in fact been detected? And our first speaker is Dr. Shanks. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? As you can tell from my accent, I'm not from around these parts. Uh, descended from a little holler in Kentucky. Um, I'm actually one of the few professors who regrets the demise of the age of blackboards and chalk. I've been forced by my colleagues to use PowerPoint but I'm sticking to the old ways as long as I can. Um, now, um, the issue before us um, is the issue, are there intelli uh, irreducibly complex biological systems? Uh, probably. Is irreducible complexity evidence of intelligent design? Uh, no. Has intelligent design been detected in biological systems? No. Could it be detected? The answer is yes. And you'll discover that Bill and I have a disagreement over the methods you would have to use to establish this interesting proposition. Uh, now, let me see if I can get the next one to come up. No, I've gone backwards. Now, I want to... Uh, I wanted to distinguish, and this was not clearly distinguished in the previous uh, talk between uh, methodological naturalism uh, or methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism. The philosophical naturalist is the person who asserts perhaps by belting a shoe after the fashion of Khrushchev on the podium only physical objects exist. The methodological naturalist is a slightly different character. This is somebody who has permitted him or herself to learn from 300 years of experience in modern science uh, that the denizens of the paranormal and the supernatural seem always to elude uh, our grasp. They're very slippery, so slippery we can't get hold of them. And so methodological naturalism embodies the working hypothesis that until such a time as we have really good, extraordinary evidence to the contrary, a working hypothesis is that we must work in the domain of the physical. Now. There is also something called supernaturalism, which can be divided in twain, uh, once again. Uh, philosophical supernaturalism um, is the view that uh, there are supernatural objects, and don't confuse me with the facts. Um, I once had the pleasure of debating Dr. Dwayne Gish, a noted creation scientist. I think he's a philosophical supernaturalist. He also tried to persuade me that there were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. Um, I believe that Bill is a methodological uh, supernaturalist. That is, he believes in the supernatural. I'll quote him. The world is a mirror representing the divine life. Intelligent design readily embraces the sacramental nature of physical reality. Indeed, intelligent design is just the logos theology of John's gospel, restated in the idiom of information theory. And Bill believes there is evidence for this. Maybe so. Whoops. 
Now, there is a long history um, of looking at the innards of organisms and perhaps even ultimately their internal molecular parts and comparing those innards to machines. Uh, the medievals, and this is the clock from Dover Tower, the medievals tended to compare the insides of organisms to clocks and they believed that just as clocks need a clockmaker, um, organisms too need a clockmaker. By the 18th century, the argument had come to hinge on analogies drawn uh, to pocket watches. Uh, today, um, in the intelligent design movement, uh, appeals are made to uh, more familiar objects since very few of us have pocket watches these days. I'm probably the only one. Um, <laughs> and uh, the appeal is to objects such as mouse traps um, or outboard motors. Um, now, it's possible that they're machines and hence they need a designer, but I'm not convinced that organisms, for all the utility of mechanical metaphors, really are machines. After all, machines don't leave offspring behind. Um, would that my aged lawnmower at home in Tennessee had left behind some younger, more functional descendants, <laughs> perhaps exhibiting some degree of variation that would make some of them more useful than others. Uh, but alas, no. Now, I want to talk about irreducible complexity. Um, and here's a functional pathway. Uh, it involves five genes or their products. And some function at the end um, is ultimately uh, produced. Uh, take away any one of the genes here, uh, you get loss of function. Um, now, how, since evolution has no eye to the future, could such a functional pathway have evolved when function is only achieved when all the present parts are in place and loss of a part.